welcome to our channel, where we set out to explore wonderful great works of literature while dressed in elegant clothing because why, why the hell, hell not? So today we have a recurring author, da, 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 da. Shirley Jackson. One of my faves. Yeah. And so, yeah, she was actually uh, really fun to, uh, to read. Um, she was an American uh, writer, uh, born December 14th in 1916 in San Francisco, and she died in 1965 at the age of 48, Eight. yeah. so really quite young. Yeah. And she, she almost had the, I think she almost had the same uh, birth date as uh, Albert Camus, and also died quite young around the same age as yeah. well as Camus. Yeah. So she's well known for her supernatural fiction, her horror, her mystery, even the psychological suspense, psychological suspense tale. Uh, she, so she had two decades of writing, she has six published novels, two memoirs and they say over 200 short stories yeah and in these collections in these uh two uh there's so many in here it's awesome two collections yeah there's there's yeah. quite a number of uh stories there as well yeah. so some of the novels are also uh included in that mm -hmm. collection as well uh she's most well known it's the story i guess the short story that really got her fame and recognition as a a horror genre writer yeah. uh, was the lottery. Yeah, and I would also say, like, arguably, the haunting on Hill House too. Yeah, yeah. And I feel like the two of them are the top. Yeah. yeah, but I think the lottery was the one that really made her name. Oh yeah. It really kind of like set her, set her up as kind of the, yeah. the 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 writer of master the, of horror. Yeah. Master of horror. That's right. And so the lottery, when it first came out, it kind of like outraged people. People were really upset by it because it showed like. The darker underbelly of human nature, and I guess maybe at the time, people really didn't want to see so much of that. It's kind of like post World War II. Mm. I think they've already had enough, perhaps, of horror, of horror <laughs> and you know the the evil inherent within all yeah. humanity, and whatnot, right? It right? Yeah, and uh, there was a there was kind of like an interesting remark that she had made about South Africa banning the story, and she's like, ah, the lottery, yeah. they actually understood the story. And so, in a, in a way, kind of like gets this idea of othering people and creating scapegoats and sort of... Ostracization. This, yeah, and like yeah. also like this barbarity that we can, even in a quiet community or a quiet sort of society, you know, we, we always have those sacrificial victims that we kind of like unleash all our forces, evil forces and guilt and whatever onto it and make them sort of like scapegoats for it. Yeah. Yeah, I was just going to say, and her husband said it was something along the lines of it being a lot about the aftermath of, of World War II. The Cold War, and, and it's in the Cold War, War as well. Yeah. Like, ongoing. And it's almost like it's almost like she didn't want people to just forget and think that, oh, just because on the outside we're pretending everything is like all right, all right and pristine Hunky and perfect in the huh. 1940s and 50s, like you think of these little nuclear families and their perfect little homes and the quiet neighborhoods and all the children playing and then actually beneath it all they're still evil yeah yeah mm -hmm. there's an element yeah strong undercurrent of that as well right like beneath the appearances beneath the surfaces yeah i think what's interesting is now is like even now in uh modern sort of historians i suppose are reassessing and reevaluating the 1950s before there was a strong like in the 20th century, later half of the latter half of the 20th century, there was like a strong cynicism towards the 1940s yeah. and 50s. Uh, but now there's kind of like a resurgence of sort of some more the dynamic undercurrents and what's going on in the 50s. And it's not quite as we are led to believe with fully like, you know, leave it to beaver or something like that. Yeah. It was definitely much more interesting than, <laughs> than, than those, those times kind of uh, portray. Uh, but she did have like a lot of... Um, I guess mental health issues. She had like agoraphobia. agoraphobia. Yeah. She had some addiction issues with prescription addiction. She had cigarette smoking. Yeah. She had like colitis. She had like a lot of health problems, and she got addicted to a lot of prescription uh, drugs, like you're yeah. saying. And it didn't help that she was also drinking alcohol quite mm -hmm. excess excessively. And yeah. Uh, yeah. So she's an interesting character. She did. Her friend circle apparently said that she felt patronized in her role as a faculty wife and yeah. she was ostr ostracized frequently from her community and neighborhood and you kind of see these themes coming up despite what her husband was saying that you know it's not really about that yeah i think uh 
yeah, and there was like almost like a very interesting ambivalence towards her children as well, and some interesting comments regarding yeah, yeah. their. Uh, you want to read that one? Where, no, where, where, where was where that? that? she wrote. She said oh. that the story that she wrote about the book, called "Life Among, Among the, Savage. the Savages" was a disrespectful memoir of my children. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, and she she said that really she didn't like to write about herself or about her writing process or. Mm -hmm. She, she and, tried to keep the personal elements out. Yeah, of and you can kind of imagine, just based on what I've read about her, and even how she writes in the description of her characters, is that she does seem like a very much like a wallflower type of person. She's very introverted. I mean, hence the agoraphobia, too, I assume, that, you know, she doesn't really like to go out and yeah. be the social butterfly. Yeah. Yeah. And so I, we were thinking, like, in terms of the approach of this video, like, we read a lot of her short stories, and... You know, Ava and I, we've read uh, a few of her novels, so you've, you've read some more as well, more than I have. So you, you got a, a deeper sense of her, her writing style as well as sort of the, the themes that yeah. recur. And so I would ask you, what, what would you say is like the most predominant theme that she kind of like explores and re-explores in her writings? Yeah, it's always the dark, the dark feminine. Um, and, and what do you mean, what, what, is that, what does that mean? Yeah, so I think... Like sometimes we think of when we think of dark feminine in kind of modern literature, we think of like femme fatale and and kind of these like really aggressively empowered in a way. Yeah, like almost what I would deem more masculine traits. Now I know in today's modern society we argue what is feminine, what is masculinity, but for the purpose of today, just to make it kind of easier to explain, um, you know, a lot of these like femme fatale characters are very almost seem to portray more of this like masculine um, horror or evils whereas in her book it's more of these passive um, what happens when you don't act how evil can happen and the the more quiet side of feminine evil yeah you know in a way there's like there's a um, how I understood it as well is like this idea of um, non-aggressive in the sense of overt aggression uh, yeah. there was a very they're very much like um, uh, an aggression through uh, non-action in a way mm -hmm. right and there was a, a few characters that are like these like older women who you know like their little you know their little house set up their little cozy environments but they're so meticulous and they're so organized but there's a militancy about their organization there's a militancy about their uh, desire to keep things status quo as it is and they're allowing things to evil to flourish in a way on the outside and they'll look the other way in order to preserve their sense of quietude yeah. and their serenity and I would say the irony of the attachment to that like that by being so attached to their kind of um, meticulous perfect house uh, Order, vis yeah. visible to everyone else yeah um, in a way by being so controlling about these things whether it's within themselves or with others in their community or trying to be controlling of their environment um they end up creating their own horror like their worst nightmare ends up becoming true in a way and chaos around surrounds them even worse yeah right? yeah like an example is you know this lower income family where the parents you never really see where the parents are and these children are kind of dressed more shabbily and you know one of them is a disabled child either learning disabled or something like maybe yeah like a learning developmental delay or something like that and running around the community and always getting lost and an example of like how just a dark but passive evil would happen is the sister of the child who's disabled came up to the old woman's house and said, did you see my, did you see my sister? Did you see my sister? Like, I'm really worried. She always tries to hitchhike and, and she might get lost. And, and the woman had seen her, but she, she was more worried about her tea sitting on the counter. Mm. And in a way, like she made this choice to not act, to yeah. not find this child so that hopefully this family would move away. Yeah. And so she says, why don't you ask the neighbor? Why don't you ask the other neighbor across yeah. the street? Yeah. Like won't answer, and she's like, "But didn't you like? Can you just answer me?" You didn't see. So she doesn't. She doesn't lie. So she still has like kind of that virtue of not lying, and yet 
she in a way she is because she's withholding the truth, right? Yeah. And so then it creates this cascade of evil also within the community. Yeah. It was like a sin of omission, omission rather than a sin of commission, yeah. right? Yeah. Yeah. And how like it's almost like very subtle. It's a subtle horror. It's a subtle malevolence. It's a subtle evil mm -hmm. that still manifests even within the feminine. Mm -hmm. That doesn't necessarily come out in like full blown you know violence, but is almost like sublimated violence. Yeah. But still has a devastating effect. Yeah, and also that the, she kind of often talks about within that feminine is like feeling like there's always the choice of either being kind to the husband or kind to the children and for some reason the characters can't be both at the same time so they're either all loving to the husband and kind of harsh with the children or all mm -hmm. loving to the children and harsh with harsh with the husband and how that's confusing for the whole family too yeah um, and on, on precisely that point it's very interesting that the husband always for the most part it's very sort of like Female centric, I guess. Yeah. Like the, the the protagonist is always a, a woman, and it's always from the feminine, uh, the female lens, and so the man is always kind of like a distal. Yeah. Or there's like sometimes these male like figures that show up in illusions, but yeah, you're right. For the most part, it's very female. Yeah. Oriented. Yeah. Yeah. From the perspective of the either whether it's even like no what age it starts at young like young adolescent girls all the way up to older women, older women. Yeah. yeah which is very interesting so it's not age centric but it's like yeah, very yeah. much feminine centric yeah yeah I, would, I agree with that yeah and there's also a very interesting way in which she plays a lot like a lot of her female characters are uh they border this they're in this like in between liminal zone between what is real and sort of almost like a full psychic psychotic episode where it's like you're in this complete illusory state this mm -hmm. mania if you will mm -hmm. there was this one story where uh, it was called the teeth yeah and sort of the woman is um you know leaving her husband to go on a trip to the dentist in, a, in sort of in the i guess it was like new york or like one of the main cities i guess it might not have been on the east coast anyway um and she's like she gets on the bus and she's kind of half asleep, a little bit in pain, a little bit drugged up, and she's she you know she keeps on the the, the the bus drops her off in like a diner, and it it seems as though she's like constantly going through the same diner, mm -hmm. experiencing the same thing over and over again. And there's this Seems mysterious person, yeah. yeah mysterious man who's kind of like with her, and you can't really tell what's real and what what isn't real. Like how much of this is her illusions or her fantasies. Uh, creeping in, bleeding into the real yeah, or world. Yeah, how much of it is this, like, she doped up? Or how much of it is she going mad? Or how much of it is there this weird supernatural yeah. man coming in? And But I know it's also, like, but a lot of her characters are trying to escape the reality in which they're inhabiting. Mm -hmm. They're trying to escape from the confines, in a way, of, like, mm -hmm. where they feel they're being constrained. Like, even in the same story, like, she's running away on the beach or something. Repeated, yeah. You know, like trying to escape in a way, and there's a lot of that recurring theme as well. Yeah, or just like trying to change the identity that they feel they've somehow been forced into. Yeah, like, like losing the Yeah, like the too. same one that's with the teeth, it was like, I think, and the subtlety in which she does it is creepy. Like, that's mm -hmm. the, the piece that I find magnetic about her, her writing is that it's so subtle that you're, you're, you have, you're listening we're reading slowly to understand and the little details make such a difference like she goes into this washroom she looks at herself in the mirror she takes off the one piece of clothing or article or jewelry whatever it was i forget that identifies her to her old life was it like a comb or something it was a breast a beret, and yeah, beret. changed her hair but then she's looking in the mirror in the bathroom Not and there's all these other women herself. there and she doesn't know which one's her own face yeah uh, yeah that gives me chills yeah. just to even yeah. say to think of that right yeah. now yeah. Yeah. And then, yeah, like the theme of being ostracized just comes up frequently. Um, and then I just think of the, the summer people and again, whether it's self-inflicted or not, right? It, it's never really clear. Is it that, are they really ostracizing you or are you not putting any effort into mm -hmm. creating a relationship? and Like a uh, self-fulfilling thing. Yeah, right? and it's like exactly like a self-fulfilling prof prophecy or a fear of being ostracized makes you ostracized yeah. um, rather than just trying to make efforts. People yeah. just 
decide to put blame on the other, so that other kind of component. Yeah. Um, and then, yeah, and then also just thinking of like the road through the wall talks a lot about being ostracized in a neighborhood if you are from from that other category and how that it weaves in and out of how that comes to be. Um, and then sometimes she really does make it quite apparent that there is a supernatural event, like in The Rock, where the couple, there's this couple, and then the third, again, another other, right? So it's a couple and then a, the sister of the, the man um, go on this boat after having, he's had an illness that he's just recovering from, and they go to this holiday on this weird, cold, dark, black rock, um, and there's this strange hotel inside of the rock, and the, the other, the woman, runs up first and from the very beginning she she kind of is in contact with the spirit essentially and um and just the experience of that of experiencing that knowing that there's one other person also who sees the spirit which is the hostess mm -hmm. and yet the couple themselves who she's the most close with don't see them at all mm -hmm. And so again, the sense of not quite belonging. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's very interesting. So she's a sort of a deeply psychological writer, but I found sometimes, I think you experienced this too, right? Where you talked about how sometimes it's difficult to follow the story. Mm -hmm. Sometimes you kind of get lost in the story. And in a way, like, I think we're compa comparing parts of it to like Gustav Meyrink's uh, The Gollum. Yeah. And there, there's sometimes you, you get into this like phantasmagoric sort of like state where you're you're weaving in and out of reality and and sort yeah. of like description of things that may not actually be happening and it's nuanced it's, and it's so nuanced yeah like there's one short story that i don't think was ever published well i guess now it was published but when she was alive it wasn't it was not quite finished uh, that we read yeah and or it was unpublished at the time and we ended and we're like i don't really understand it, it had to do with like a mouse oh the white mouse the white mouse dying and she killing it. Anyway, it was, and we're like, I don't <laughs> really- We're not really giving you much description on it. No, the, the, but- But we had to look it up and someone had suggested end, that there was something yeah, was about like creepy. a pregnant, pregnant mouse. It was creepy and it was again, that element of control, control of the husband. Yeah, um, yeah and then in the end, it was very new, nuanced that this mouse represented like the fact that she refused to have children kind of thing. And that was her form of control in that relationship. Yeah. Yeah, it's interesting because with this you can you can look at it through a psychological lens, but like yeah. I think it kind of unveils sort of the the more darker, mysterious, supernatural, fantastical sort of like yeah. underbelly of that. Yeah, I don't think you. Yeah, I think it. She that's what she does beautifully. Is she merges the two that the two are not mutually exclusive. Yeah, right? that you know supernatural it can be mental. Yeah. In illness, but then mental illness can create supernatural like you know yeah. there's no and if we try to put it under one lens then it makes it less horror yeah like, that if you were to just say oh it's just mental health then it wouldn't be as scary right if yeah there's an element of the supernatural that's what makes it really creepy yeah again like that that would rationalize it right yeah. and dismiss yeah. it away yeah but in the fact like the psyche is a mysterious thing mm -hmm. of all these weird you know Entities, let's say, that kind of manifest and sort of like come to us and disappear and like influence our mood. So there's certainly an element of like mystical aspect to that. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So. Anyway, I feel like you could take any one of these novels and have a really wonderful conversation or a short story even and have a great conversation yeah. about it. But we decided since we had read quite a few of them to talk about her in general. And yeah. then honestly, you could read any one of her novels and. They're so entertaining and confusing and scary and creepy and um, we we yeah. we won we covered in one of our reviews the haunting on Hill House. Mm -hmm. Now you really enjoyed that one. Yeah, that was probably the first one that I read of her. Yeah, I think. Yeah. yeah, and ever since I'm hooked. So you recommend that one for sure. Anything yeah. else that you recommend? Like any particular stories that you would? Uh... Um, I liked the cottage. The I have... summer people. Oh, oh, sorry, the summer, summer people. people. Yeah. yeah, sorry, not. The <laughs> that's just it's about a cottage yeah. Yeah. um i really like i really liked like some of the other ones like t i really liked the rock because of the imagery of the rock and and she plays a lot with even like 
the element of, of texture, like the smooth surfaces of the rock and jagged. And I feel again, it's kind of embodies the feminine. It's like the smooth, like smooth, soft exterior, uh. and yet this like can be quite cold and jagged on the inside. Uh. Um, no, that's so I think she she often does do that. Like she uses her environment to describe the turmoil someone might be going through, mm -hmm. um, very subtly. Um, so yeah, I think honestly any of them. I have yet to read one that I dislike. Some I just don't necessarily fully understand yeah, as much. Same. But yeah. How would you rate her? How would you rate well, her I'll, stories? And then they give her five. Five. Yeah. Okay. How can you rate that many stories and be that good? Yeah. Like, yeah, that's true. I mean, there's so many classic literature that I read and I'm just like, well, I love this story about them and then not this one at all, really, you know? Like, yeah. it's kind of hit or miss, whereas I find with her, she's consistent and she's good at what she does. Like, she didn't try to dabble in other, feel, as far as I know, didn't try to dabble in other completely different genres of writing. She really mastered what she had, what yeah. she did, and... Um, I appreciate that. It's yeah. like knowing what you're good at, sticking with it, and somehow, within the same type of story, you know, even the same themes repeatedly, each story is so different, so mm. completely different. Mm. There's no redundancy. Like, even though we talk about these themes, I've not yet seen, like, oh yeah, that's kind of, Shorty did that in this dog story. They're completely different. Mm. And I think that's like, what a mind to have had that. Yeah. 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 Wow. Okay. Yeah. That's great. <laughs> yeah, we've been wanting to cover her for some for some time now, but we wanted to get a more fulsome uh, overview of yeah. her. Yeah. We've her also been. Oeuvre. We've also just been tired. Yeah. Well, we're glad we finally got to it or got yeah. around to it. Well, anyway, thank you for joining us, uh, and we hope uh, you know you can uh, take some time and read some of her writings as well. It's and they're short, worth it. so you know what? If you're busy, like honestly, some of them are so short. You you don't have an excuse. Pages. Yeah. Like, and they're awesome, and then they'll make you want to keep reading. Yeah. So if you feel yeah. like you're in a reading rut, pick it up. Yeah, very, very true. <laughs> All right, well, thank you for joining us. You have a great evening, and we will speak to you next time. Take care. <laughs>